turn 12 o'clock. We are very excited to be here. I'm Dr. Melanie Barham, and I'm really delighted to be moderating this panel. Um, we are here in across the United States, and I'm in Canada, um, and we are really pleased to be talking about careers in public practice today as a panel discussion. If you are joining us online, uh, make sure that you can see your Q&A at the bottom so that you can um, ask us any questions that you want and that you can and feel free to do that throughout. This session will be recorded uh, so that we can make sure that we're putting it out later and you can watch it later if you want to re-listen or if you want to share with a friend. Um, I want to recognize all of our partners who have collaborated to make this possible, starting with the left, uh, starting at the left of our slide, the National Association of Federal Veterinarians, the American Veterinary Medical Association, uh, Vet Stego Diversify, the United States Animal Health Association, American College of uh, Pre Veterinary Preventative Medicine, and the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Valerie Reagan and the uh, Center for Private and Corporate um, veterinary medicine as well, um, and public veterinary medicine. Dahlia, I'm certain that I butchered that, but that the, the, the acronym, but I know you'll get to, you'll correct me when we get to your slides. So sorry about that. Um, so if you, again, make sure that you've got that Q&A at the bottom and you won't be able to unmute yourself or show your video, but you're very welcome to ask as many questions as you want. And our incredible panelists are really, I'm, I'm just so excited to have this amount of experience in the room today. So we have a real treat for you today. So with that, without further ado, how this is going to work, how, we're, how this is going to work is we're going to go through people's, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a bio and intro for each person and what they, um, what, you know, their experience. And then we're going to go into some questions that are going to tell you a little bit more about what public practice is all about and what the opportunities are like. And then we're going to open the floor for more questions. So um, please feel free to get engaged and be really active or just kick back and listen. So as the moderator, uh, it's my unlucky position to go first and share who I am. So my name is Melanie Barham again. I'm a veterinarian. I have a project management professional designation and an MBA in sustainable commerce. I went to school in Canada and I continue to reside in Canada. I have worked in the United States as well. Um, my career has really spanned a number of different areas, um, including, um, including equine practice uh, in North America and then working in surveillance as well. And then working as a they, um, were founding a, a private industry, a private um, company that supported veterinary careers and working in consulting. And now I am the CEO of, of Vet Stego Diversify, which is a careers development company. And also this, and I also am the acting CEO for a veterinary charity called Community Veterinary Outreach, which provides um, pro bono veterinary care and human health care. So one health approach to um, homeless people and their pets in communities across Canada. So we, um, so it's been a very gratifying journey and lots of different, um, lots of different roles. And I think the question that we were prompted with on this panel was, what led you here? And truthfully, um, curiosity is what has led me all different places. Sometimes, sometimes. Um, career crunches or different decisions that I that I had to make if I was, you know, depending leaving practice or staying in practice. But truthfully, I've been able to really lucky to follow curiosity. And it's been a wonderful journey throughout different kinds of, of veterinary medicine. So I'm going to pass the torch over to our next panelist. Joe, if you could go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, I, I did have a second slide here. Um, so Vet Stego Diversify, um, we provide events and conferences, career support courses and coaching, and we have a large community of over 26,000 veterinary professionals globally. Um, and we do recruiting. So there is our, there's our um, information and then community veterinary outreach I touched on. And it's very exciting to be part of uh, CVO because it's um, it's been around for 20 years growing and having now we have 11 and soon to be 12 locations across Canada and two in the United States too. Um, so that, that organization is there too if you're looking for some volunteer opportunities and that will come up in our talk about how to get involved and how to do things differently to build your skill sets. So um, let's pop, let's go to the next slide. Oh, these are my uh, hobbies as well. And my one of my, some of my best advice is really around following your curiosity when you're in service of others. So thinking around how can you solve a problem? How can you look for different ways to do things? Um, looking for alignment with your values. Um, often we look, we make choices about our careers, sometimes out of necessity and sometimes at the beginning of our careers because we like the animal that we thought that we wanted to work with. But the parameters of our career are so different than um, 
and there's so many different opportunities depending on how you how you might take it. I never thought that I would be in school. I thought I would be an equine practitioner until the day I died. And so I could not, like if I was back in school, I could never have imagined where I would be right now, but I couldn't be happier where I am. So I think those are, and I think that might be a recurring theme throughout our panel is that <clears throat> a lot of us in school um, make a path, but then there's other things that happen or we decide that we like different things and that is okay. And it's actually really great to be able to do that. Um, the careers research that I did really showed that 85% of us don't end up in the career that we thought we did in veterinary school. And that is okay. Um, and that people are satisfied and they love what they're doing when they can, when they can get okay with making changes and making shifts. And that you know, there's lot, there's so many opportunities. When we surveyed over a thousand veterinarians, um, that was for my MBA project, we found so many different, uh, so many different places that people where veterinarians were, and so many different ways that they found satisfaction in their careers. And it's all about riding out those bumps where you feel like things are not as happy as you might like them to be, making a change, and finding a finding a different way to do things. Um, and your unique perspectives. Are needed in this profession. So whatever background you came from, whatever area you're interested in, and whatever family of origin you came from, your unique experience is needed to make this profession modernized and to make it to make it what it needs to be in the next 20 years. So you're very welcome here. And this is really about that's what I really see about veterinary medicine is that we we all need to be engaged and and we're all we all need to participate because our experiences are all valuable. So I will turn it over to our next person. So Donna, I'm so excited to introduce Donna and I will turn it over to you. And I love, I love this picture of you, Donna. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, I'm Dr. Donna DeBonis. I have my master's in food safety. My project was on pet food and I'm a preventive control qualified individual in animal food, which basically means that according to the new Food Safety Modernization Act, I'm the one who signs off on a food safety plan for any of the pet food facilities that are producing animal food. So that is quite the uh, responsibility, of course. Uh, I just stepped down as president of the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians. I served in that capacity first as an incoming uh, president for two years, then president, and now I have two more years as past president. <laughs> At this time, I'm the pet food safety consultant. I have my own business and I live on Whidbey Island in Washington state. I've been doing that for the past two years. I am probably the poster child for changing your career after having been in private practice for many years. In fact, I'd been in 25 years and then I was uh, approached by the army to join the Army Veterinary Corps as a reservist, which I had no idea existed. So I did that for 12 years. And at the time that I, I got out of the Army, it had been about 2020, and I had risen in rank to Lieutenant Colonel. And I had also been a commander of a medical unit, which was of doctors and nurses and other human healthcare providers. And that unit was over 100 people. I went to school at CSU and I got my DVM in 1983. I got my master's in 2019, thanks to the Army, because I used my GI Bill. And by the way, I too never thought I'd be going back to school. I thought 1983, that's it. I got through this, I'm done. And here I was going back to school using my GI Bill. At this point, I am going into the, uh, the veterinary forensic certification program at the University of Florida Vet School. And that's just a three semester program of five credits. And I was brought to that simply because of the fact that again, having the GI Bill, it was available. And at a, I'm at a time in my life where surely I can do what I want and follow my interests. Currently, of course, I'm still very much interested in pet food recalls and pet food contamination. That's a huge passion of mine, and I pretty much drilled down to find out how it was possible that a pet food even got contaminated, especially as we're looking at the current food safety laws that are applicable to pet food. My veterinary forensics uh, idea came into place because of an animal cruelty case that occurred here of almost 75 animals, some of whom died 
two horses. And I felt very compelled to explore again what's going on in animal welfare. And I found that veterinary forensics is developed to particularly help prosecute animal cruelty cases. So what put this opportunity in front of me, as far as the Army, was that the Army had been looking for years to recruit me. And when I'd open the package, it'd be mostly for, you know, just active duty. I didn't know any better till I received an email uh, in 2006, and it was from a colonel. I come from a military family, so I thought respectfully, I'll reply. And I said, sir, do you see how old I am? I was 50 years old at the time. And he just popped me an email back right away and said, hey, if you're healthy, we'll write you an age waiver. So the conversation began for and over two years. I explored everything that was possible to do in the Army Reserves and the kind of stability that would offer my family. Next slide. So as I said, US Army has active and reserves. Reserves are the best kept secret. I'm gonna just tell you that you have benefits that are pretty much the same for each. Your ID card looks exactly the same for active and reserves. So you have the ability to have the same salary and, and as an active uh, Army veterinarian. And by the way, um, Army veterinarians serve all the other uh, branches of the military. All of the veterinarians are consolidated in, under the branch of the Army. And likewise, active duty veterinarians and reserve veterinarians train together. So we've really become a pretty tight-knit group of around 700. Uh, our roles are kind of unusual. We're in charge of both food safety and public health, as well as the military working dog and other military working animals. So food safety is kind of an interesting uh, idea within the Army in that if you think about it, the USDA has veterinarians and that's exactly what they do. They're in charge of food safety. So in this case, we were responsible for determining that the food was safe for all of the personnel in the Army. And so that was a fantastic opportunity to get back of uh, military um, and get behind the manufacturing facilities for both food and water and see what was going on back there. And it became quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting type of thing for me to pursue. So as far as public health, we do experience that as clinical veterinarians, but in the army, it is, specific, it is specifically important, especially concerning zoonotic diseases. So the public health portion came into play and the food safety and that because I was in the army and that led to my role in AFSPHV and consequently after about eight years in that organization I became president. Next slide. So as I said I was a practice owner for 25 years and always like many of us not really quite making enough money just as a clinical veterinarian so I had a lot of side hustles going on. Sometimes I taught college, which was quite lucrative. Sometimes I worked, um, oddly enough, in industry. And always I came back to clinical medicine and actually owned my practice, two practices over the course of 25 years. But when I stepped away from private practice and joined the Army in 2008, the Army Reserve really became my main focus and even though it's considered just sort of a part-time job when you're in the reserves, once you get activated for training or deployment, then you become an active duty veterinarian. So you always have to be aware that any jobs that you take on the side from the Army Reserves has to uh, be you know, pretty much forgiving of you being gone for long periods of time. So what I did is I just took on contract work work um, as a clinical veterinarian in between. During that time, I was able to work in clinical medicine and also government work. So at this point, um, I have five horses, I have three dogs and three cats. I enjoy my time doing gardening when the weather's beautiful out here on Whidbey Island. And I run an event business here at my ranch at Eagle Pond Ranch. 
I also, when I went out of the army, thought I was going to retire because technically I was old enough. But then I found that, you know, the brain doesn't stop working. <laughs> so I decided to open up my own pet food safety consulting company. Next slide. And Dr. Michael Gilsdorf, whose presentation is recorded, is next. Thank you. Super. So Joe, if you want to just press play, Dr. Gilsdorf couldn't be here today because he had a back surgery. So, but he did, he went as just a dedicated person that he is, he's gone ahead and recorded. So if you want to press play, that'd be just wonderful. Thanks. Hello everyone. This is Mike Gilsdorf and I'm going to talk to you about my public practice career. I'm currently a member of most of these associations on your screen. I'm going to be very brief so I can try to tell you as much as I can here. I will, I'm currently the Chief Veterinary Consultant with the International Animal Health Solutions, which is my own company. I was previously the Executive Vice President for the National Association of Federal Veterinarians and the Director of the National Center for Animal Health Programs within Veterinary Services, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service of the federal government. I went to veterinary school at, at Kansas State University and I got a master's in microbiology at Iowa State University. I worked on major VS livestock disease programs and did research on brucellosis vac uh, vaccination. And I worked especially in brucellosis and tuberculosis programs. Uh, as far as the opportunity of what, how did I get into the line of work that I uh, worked in as when I was uh, in veterinary college, they uh, veterinary services gave a presentation when I was a senior. So I, that's let me know about it. I intended to go in equine small animal practice, but they didn't want to pay very much. I could make more money to start out with in the federal government. So that's where I went. I intended to go temporarily, but I thought what I was doing was more important than being in private practice. So I stayed with it. As the, uh, a consultant right now, I work in other countries. Uh, I primarily help governments or ranchers and dairymen uh, in, ex in uh, controlling or eradicating brucellosis and tuberculosis primarily. Um, I've also worked and helped with the import-export equivalence requirements for animals and animal products, which I did with veterinary services in the previous positions. As the executive vice president, I was, I started doing that when I retired from the federal government in 2017 until 2019. And I, uh, Dr. Joe and Ellie will be talking more about NAFE, so I will be in 18. As the director of the National Center for Animal Health Programs within Veterinary Services, I essentially worked in all kinds of areas of veterinary services before I became the director. I wanted to show you uh, one slide on how many veterinarians uh, work within the federal government. Uh, there's about 3,000 veterinarians in the state government. There's about 2,000. Uh, I can tell you uh, the different agencies they work for, but there are about 22 different agencies. And we can go through in detail to tell you more about uh, what you can do in those agencies and so forth, but I don't have time at this place here to, to go through that. But I do have extra slides to show you. So with that, I'll stop and uh, try to if you have questions, uh, we'll see how we can handle that. Super, thank you. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Anelli. So go ahead, Joe. One, one second, I have to take myself off mute here to be able to then go back to the presentation. And uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Joe Anelli. <clears throat> um, I'm currently the executive vice president of the National Association of Federal Veterinarians. And the common theme here is I never thought I would be doing that either. Um, I started out uh, wanting to be a small animal practitioner. I was a high school teacher for four years before deciding to go to veterinary school. And um, I was working summers in, uh, in an animal hospital. 
and decided I liked that work better than the teaching work and, uh, and decided to go to, uh, to veterinary school. I'll drop to the bottom of this slide quickly that uh, I started veterinary school at Araneta University in the Philippines, which uh, amazingly set up a, uh, a great deal of uh, opportunities for me in the future that I'd never thought about. I then finished my clinical training at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And then later, um, after working for USDA for a while, um, got a master's degree from the University of Minnesota as part of a program that, um, that USDA had to send people to uh, training opportunities. Uh, and then I, I added this because uh, I, I, you know, when that program was with uh, both the College of Veterinary Medicine and the School of Public Health. So it was a, an excellent sort of One Health background before the term One Health <clears throat> was being used. And then I, I have a master's degree prior to going to veterinary school. And I mention it because it's from Long Island University. I know we have at least one person, um, a student from LIU's new veterinary school at CW Post campus, which is where I got my master's from. So I thought that would be an interesting uh, full circle turn from, uh, from things that I've done. Because of that experience of having gone to school in the Philippines and then finished at the University of Tennessee, I hadn't taken the veterinary accreditation exam. I was on a career path that I thought I wanted to do, uh, which was small animal practice. Then I needed to get accredited because I had a large number of military personnel traveling overseas with their pets and needed international health certificates and you needed to be accredited to sign international health certificates. So <clears throat> I was scheduled to go out to Long Island to, the, uh, to Kennedy Airport to take the exam. And after taking the exam, the port veterinarian said to me, had you ever considered a job with the federal government? And I said, well, no, not really. And I was thinking that this was uh, meat inspection and I didn't particularly want to do meat inspection. I wanted to do small animal work. So um, he started talking to me about the, uh, the opportunities with the federal government. And uh, interestingly, while I was at the University of Tennessee, every Friday before uh, clinics, we had a federal veterinarian come in and talk to us about foreign animal diseases. And that sounded really interesting, really cool stuff to be working with, uh, you know, these rare diseases that didn't exist in the United States, but existed elsewhere and so on. So when the port veterinarian mentioned to me, had I been interested in uh, a job with the federal government, I hadn't thought about it, but then it brought back those memories of, uh, of opportunities that, uh, that I could work with foreign animal diseases. And uh, turns out they had an opening right there in New York City, a position that was hard to fill. I mean, you don't get very many large animal veterinarians looking for jobs in New York City, um, but they, they had an opening. And about two months later, I was hired as the section BMO for New York and Long Island. The interesting thing about that is that uh, I ended up having one of the largest um, outbreaks of avian influenza in live bird markets in New York City, Long Island, and uh, New Jersey. So I ended up running a, uh, a major disease eradication program among these 40 live bird markets. And uh, that brought me to the attention of uh, folks in, in Washington that, uh, that I had some capabilities in this area and they recruited me for a position with uh, swine. They were starting the pseudorabies eradication program and they had nobody that, um, that was trained in swine medicine. Uh, everybody who was trained in swine medicine was retiring because they were working on the classical swine fever outbreak, which was disease eradicated in the mid 1970s. So uh, there were no, uh, none of those experts around. So I got to uh, go to University of Minnesota where my entire graduate program was paid for and I was receiving full salary 
while I went to uh, while I went to school for a master's degree. It was kind of a combined MS MPH program, and um, and ended up in a position as the national swine epidemiologist, and worked on eradicating pseudorabies and swine. One of the amazing things about that, something I could have never considered having done uh, in private practice was for a while I was recognized as one of the world's experts in the eradication of pseudorabies virus. And uh, after, after that, I uh, became director of National Animal Health Program staff. That's one of the ones that Mike had also been in charge of. Uh, it was a program of 22 uh, animal health programs, all the way from transmissible spongiform encephalopathies to aquaculture. And uh, it was quite a challenge to try and keep up with all of these multiple disease situations. I had experts working for me in each of those areas, but it was an amazing growth opportunity. Then uh, I was asked to take over the director of emergency programs position, which ended up bringing me kind of full circle. You know, one of the things that they were saying is that they had no one in the United States who'd ever seen things like foot and mouth disease. Um, and here I'm raising my hand going, well, wait a minute. I went to vet school in the Philippines. I've, saw, I've seen foot and mouth disease. In fact, I even know how to vaccinate for it and how to, how to deal with it as a management disease. So it was amazing that it brought that experience right around to where I, I needed it to work as a federal veterinarian in an area that I never thought I was going to be doing before. Um, from that experience, we had uh, uh, outbreaks of avian influenza H5N1 in 2005, 2006 worldwide. This was before it reached the United States. And there was a program out of the White House called Avian Influenza and Pre Pandemic Preparedness we wrote uh, guidelines and had um, billions of dollars of funding to try and control um, avian influenza H5N1 globally and also having the healthcare system of the United States be prepared in the event that there was an ongoing human to human transmission of, uh, of H5N1. And uh, fortunately that, uh, that did not happen. But one of the things you may be hearing about most recently is that this H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza has been in the United States now for two years. And um, it's uh, led to the killing of um, the largest number of poultry in, in the United States. And uh, now there's a spillover from poultry to mammalian species. We'd always known about mink and, and so on, but there are now sea, sea lions, seals that are becoming infected and, and there's a greater expanse of uh, mammals that are becoming infected. So there's a greater concern that perhaps this spillover may happen and that our next pandemic could very well be this avian influenza H5N1 if it becomes an efficient human to human transmitted virus. And, uh, and through those activities, I was also the director of the One Health Coordination staff where we looked at just that interface of human animal and environmental health. Um, I retired and, um, and started my own company of practical One Health Solutions and uh, did some consulting work for the WHO, the World Health Organization, and for the Food and Agriculture Organization. And then Mike Gilsdorf approached me and said, gee, have you ever thought about a job as the executive vice president of the National Association of Federal Veterinarians? Brought me back 30 years where I responded, well, no, not really, but tell me something about it. And, uh, and it just seemed an outstanding opportunity to continue the work that I'd been doing and apply it for the benefit of my uh, former colleagues in, um, in federal service. And uh, one of the things we were asked to talk about is, is what, uh, what guided your career. And, and some, in my case, some of it was just serendipitous. It was being in the 
right place at the right time. But I think just as important as that is being able to answer that call when it comes and, and not say, no, I'm not ready for it, but stepping up to the challenge. So what is the National Association of Federal Veterinarians? It's a constituent body of the American Veterinary Medical Association. It was formed during an AVMA meeting in 1918. So it's an organization that's over hundred years old. It's grown now from this small group of Bureau of Animal Industry Veterinarians to approximately 50% of the federal veterinarians in the, in the country. We have about 1,500 members um, and uh, it's recognized by the Department of Agriculture as a, an organization of um, supervisors and managers. And the, uh, the importance there is that we contribute to the, uh, the running of the, of the agency by bringing members' opinions to leadership and explaining to them how things are actually working in the field and what may need to be done to improve outcomes. And we also advocate for veterinarians in federal service and have expanded our, our, uh, our reach to state, local, tribal um, veterinarians that are also working in government service, but not federal government. And the sorts of things that we do, we work with AVMA and others on the veterinary loan repayment programs. So as you're looking at taking a uh, position with, uh, with potentially one of the federal or state agencies, there are um, veterinary loan repayment programs that you can avail yourselves of. And there are um, funding going into that. We're working on veterinary professional pay, special pay, specialty pay, and locality pay, so that it will bring the uh, starting salaries of private practice veterinarians uh, and public practice veterinarians more in line with each other. Uh, we're also working, uh, there are a great deal of vacancies within the food safety and inspection service and all of the other federal agencies are having trouble hiring uh, people into uh, federal service. So we are working on ways that we can get them additional funding to be able to support incentives for bringing people on board. We're also working on some overtime issues. One of the things that you can get in uh, public practice that generally doesn't show up in private practice <clears throat> is you're working a 40 hour week, five, you know, five days a week, 40 hours a week, and anything beyond that, you are paid overtime. Uh, there are some limitations to that where you're usually a grade 12, GS 12, and your overtime is just based on a GS 10 salary. So um, we're working on that. We're working on passing some One Health bills in Congress and making sure that those are adequately um, supported and funded. And then we, we monitor different pieces of legislation and how they may affect the uh, public practice veterinary sector. And a, and a selfish little um, plug, is that uh, veterinary students can join NAFB for just $10 a year, and you will get all of the networking opportunities that you can reach out to our members and ask them about their experience with positions and where they're currently working, and also get, uh, get other insights into uh, federal positions that are open up, opening up. With that, I'll turn it over to um, Joy Bennett, uh, for the next component. Or um, Melanie, do you want to say a few words first? Melanie, Joy? Melanie, you're on. Oh, I'm on mute. Goodness gracious. Oh, okay. uh, so what I was just wanted to yeah, just round up for a second because I want to chunk and check a little bit where we're at because we have really, you know, we've had so much great information from several panelists already. So if you're listening, one thing that you can really do that is helpful in this scenario because you're going to hear so many cool stories is just to take a piece of paper and just write down anything that really struck you as like, wow, that was interesting or I'd like to know more about that. So whether that was, you know, wor working on, on foreign animal diseases or any of, the, any of these opportunities 
opportunities or a question that you might have, just jot it down and also make sure you're popping your questions in. I don't see a lot of questions in there. So feel free to, to add them in because we are going to come to that. So I don't want you to forget them. Um, go ahead and um, jo Joy, go right ahead. Sure. Thank you. Um, good afternoon or good morning, I suppose, depending on the time zone that you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Joy Bennett. I am the state veterinarian for New York. Um, I'm also the director of the Division of Animal Industry at the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Um, I've been with the State Department of Agriculture for 19 years. Prior to becoming director, I was a supervisor and program manager for livestock and poultry health programs, um, including the avian influenza surveillance and the live bird marketing system, the livestock market and dealer inspection program, and New York's National Poultry Improvement Plan program. So prior to working for state ag, I was a supervisory public health veterinarian with USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service, where I was stationed at a large hog slaughter plant in Indiana. Um, and prior to that, I was in private practice and a dairy cattle practice in central New York. Uh, I am a graduate of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell University, and I also received my master's of public health from the State University of New York at Albany and board certification from the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. Um, as far as my research interests, um, our department doesn't conduct much research. Um, we are primarily a regulatory agency, but we do occasionally have the opportunity to support or assist other agencies or institutions in their research. Um, but generally speaking, I am interested in any research with a focus on production animal agriculture um, as it fits into our mission to keep New York farms safe, productive, and profitable. So what was it that put this opportunity in front of me? Um, well, for one thing, I think that it's uh, always important to keep an open mind about career possibilities. Uh, private practice may be the right option for some, but it may not be the right choice for everyone. And it's important to know what other options and opportunities exist in the field of veterinary medicine. Uh, one piece of advice I would give is to seek out good mentors. Um, I had two people early on in my career that also worked at my department that I tried to model myself after. Both of those um, had attended the Master's in Public Health program at SUNY Albany, and they'd also taken um, the board exam in veterinary preventive medicine. So I decided to follow in their footsteps and I'm really glad that I did. Um, they both now have been retired from the state for many years. One of the, them went on to work for the CDC and the other one went on to work for the USDA, but I will be forever grateful to them for their advice, knowledge um, and guidance. So next slide, please. So we do a variety of things in the division of animal industry. Um, one of the most important things I think that we do is we are continually preparing for animal health threats. Some of these threats could have potentially devastating impacts on our state's agricultural economy um, and could also severely limit international trade opportunities for our state. Um, our field veterinarians are trained to recognize and respond to the four animal diseases that could have harmful effects on animal health and in some cases public health as well. So last year in 2022, our field veterinarians conducted 58 foreign animal disease investigations in various species including cattle, hogs, horses, llamas, poultry, white-tailed deer, and rabbits. Uh, fortunately, we did not detect any foreign animal diseases in 2022, um, except that we did have several premises that did test positive for highly pathogenic avian influenza, which was certainly not unique to the state of New York, um, as the whole country has been dealing with that disease uh, for um, a couple of years now. So in New York, we have a field staff of 10 veterinarians and 17 animal health inspectors who are involved with not only preparing for and responding to high impact disease threats, but they're also involved in more routine day-to-day -day activities such as inspections of livestock markets, livestock dealers, uh, captive service facilities, swine feeders, and the live bird markets. So even though we are a State Department of Agriculture and most of our focus is on livestock and poultry health, we also have regulations that address companion animals. So we do inspect pet dealers, municipal shelters, and dog control officers as well. Um, and in New York, the legislature just recently passed a law that requires all dog and cat rescues and shelters to meet certain minimum requirements and standards of care. So that will also broaden the scope of our inspection responsibilities when that law goes into effect. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, Joe, we've lost the slides there. Well, I'll just keep on going and, and hopefully we'll come back. Um, so there are a lot of good reasons to work for the State Department of Agriculture. Um, the work tends to be very fulfilling and rewarding because you can have a dramatic impact on animal and human populations through establishing and implementing policies and procedures um, which protect both animal health and public health. 
Um, and although we are a regulatory agency, we also have opportunities to support and promote the state's animal agricultural industry. So for example, last week in New York, it was Ag Literacy Week and a few of our staff members, in addition to the commissioner, uh, took part by reading a selected book to elementary school students um, to educate them about the importance of agriculture. Um, so I know many of our field staff participated in that and they look forward to Ag Literacy, uh, at Ag Literacy Week every year. Uh, in my opinion, the very best part of my job is the people that I work with every day. Our staff is truly outstanding and I have the utmost confidence in them uh, to be able to handle any situation that comes in our direction. We work collaboratively with a lot of different organizations and agencies. Um, uh, for example, other divisions in our department, including Division of Milk Control and Dairy Services or Division of Ag Development, Food Safety and Inspection and the Food Lab, um, other agencies and organizations our state's diagnostic lab at Cornell University, we interact with them daily. Um, they have provided us tremendous support uh, to the department as well as New York's agricultural producers. We also work closely with uh, the New York State Department of Envir Environmental Conservation and the New York State Department of Health as well as the New York City Department of Health. Um, also on a daily basis, we work with USDA, primarily veterinary services, but we also have occasion to work with wildlife services and food safety inspection service as well. Um, so we do a lot of collaborative work um, in state ag. And of course, we work closely with other state animal health officials, um, especially with the state veterinarians and their staff um, in our neighboring states in the Northeast. Um, the thing about this job is there's something new every day. Uh, even after being employed here for nearly 20 years, there seems to be new animal health threats to plan and prepare for. There are changes in laws and policies that we need to adapt to, or sometimes we respond to disease outbreaks uh, for diseases that we thought we had contained and eradicated years ago. A good example of that was in 2021. In New York, we had a detection of pseudo rabies in feral swine, and it took us by surprise. We really hadn't seen that disease for decades in New York. Um, so it really is never a dull moment. This job really presents some good opportunities to be able to use your creative problem-solving skills. And of course, um, there are excellent benefits working for the state we have excellent health benefits, dental and vision. Um, we have pension plan, which I know is not the norm anymore. Um, we have a deferred compensation plan, which is similar to 401k. Um, we also have telecommuting options for people that have office positions. And for our field veterinarians, they get to make their own schedules. It provides them flexibility to adjust their schedules to accommodate whatever's going on in their personal lives, whether it's getting their kids on the bus in the morning, um, going to a doctor's appointment in the middle of the day, or taking vacation at any point during the year. So I know that that flexibility for them is um, a good job benefit. Um, we also have a generous leave package. We have sick leave, personal leave, vacation time, um, more than you could ask for really. And um, what's one of the most important things to me is that we also have ample opportunities for continuing education for our field staff. Um, the department is a continuing education provider in our state and I'm a huge supporter of continuing education. So for me, that is uh, one of the top benefits of this job. And of course, it gives you a, a good work-life balance. Um, coming from private practice, it's, it's been many years for me now, but the hours with the state are much more reasonable um, than I worked in private practice. And while we do have some emergencies, uh, work on weekends and holidays is usually a pretty rare event. So all in all, it's a pretty great place to work. And I think that that can be supported by the fact that we have an ex excellent employee retention rate. Uh, once people join our team, they tend to stay for the duration or at least until they um, reach retirement age. Um, so with that, um, if you have any questions, I did put my email on the first slide. If it doesn't get, if your question doesn't get answered in this webinar today, please don't hesitate to contact me and I will turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you. Super, thank you so much. And Joy, you really highlighted some stuff around total compensation, which I think is really important um, because it is different than perhaps a private practice salary where you'd get just a straight salary and that would be in there be maybe some, some other things, but the gamut of compensation is so vast in a federal and state and public role. It's really important to consider all of those things and what you may not need to pay for anymore if you have, if you're in this kind of role. So Wanda, I am gonna hand it over to you. Um, I can't wait to hear, uh, I can't wait to hear your background and hear what you all the how you hear your career path is it sounds so different from anything that we have in Canada. So hi, I'm Commander Wanda Wilson Egby. Can you hear me? I have yes, a master's. Great. I have a master's in public health and a, I'm a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. 
I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Health and Human Services Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. Probably know us if you've heard of it before as the National Disaster Medical System. And we respond to public health emergencies, disasters, and we uh, protect animals during national security special events as veterinarians. Of course, all the humans are covered as well. Um, I am the director of the National Veterinary Response Team. And that is a group of, I think we have 125 veterinarians and technicians um, plus uh, staffing that are intermittent federal employees. And we do Wanda, you're just coming through a little responses bit responses to these, et cetera. I'm sorry, I had a volleyball um, tournament. Okay, maybe if you want to turn off your camera, that might help because it might mean we could use, yeah, so because that might be, that might be helpful. Very good, very good. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, that's much better, thanks. Oh, good, good. So I'm just gonna pause on the National Veterinary Response Team, who's a super group of people that um, our uh, regular practicing veterinarians can join our team. So they're a group of intermittent federal employees. And ASPR hires practicing med med medical doctors, nurses, physicians, veterinarians, Etc. to respond to emergencies that are currently in practices within their state. So if we need veterinarians, for example, a um, call will go out on hhs.gov that we're looking for veterinarians to join the National Veterinary Response Team. You go through a long application process and then you join our team. And then when we're activated, you will then become a federal employee just for the period of time that you're being deployed. We have other questions about that, but I won't spend too much time on all of that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I'm a graduate of Tuskegee. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Graduate of Tuskegee University. I did a residency, I didn't put it on here at Purdue. Um, I did a um, emergency and critical care residency. I practiced for 15 years in emergency and critical care. I wanted to start a family. It's too busy. I got exhausted. Um, it's great work and I loved every moment of it, but I wanted to change my life to focus on my family. And when I was in veterinary school, the Commission Corps Public Health Service used to come to our annual conference and I went to the booth and, and they talked to me about it. Um, the Commission Corps hires um, students in two ways. Um, so you can be a junior for the public health service the summer between your junior and senior year, which is what I did. Or you can be a senior commission officer student where you get hired right after graduation. Um, and then you have you owe the organization a few years. So you have to stay in the organization maybe two or three years, depending on what your contract says. My first job in the public health service um, was at the Department of Agriculture as an epidemiologist. I was not trained as an epidemiologist, so I hurriedly went to um, college again at the University of Iowa, where I paid for myself to go. Um, the public health service offers the GI Bill just like the other uniform services, Army, Navy, Air Force, et cetera. Um, but I didn't take advantage of it because I wanted to use that money for my daughter who is now about to go to college. And what the GI Bill will provide for her is equal tuition, boarding, food for a, the state cost of any state school that she gets into. So if she goes to University of Hawaii, and University of Hawaii's um, tuition is $14,000, they will pay the $14,000. So if she wants to go to Harvard, um, the state tuition will be paid for and we have to pay the difference. So it's a great advantage that GI Bill. Um, next slide, please. 
I'm a hustle through the rest of them. The Public Health Service is a great organization to be a part of. Our commander in chief is the US Surgeon General, um, and he is in Health and Human Services as am I. Um, although I worked for the US Department of Agriculture as a Public Health Service Officer, um, it's an adjacent organization that we can be detailed to. And we have about 28 officers in FSIS, the Food Safety Inspection Service. Um, yeah, that's our Surgeon General there. Next slide. Um, so who are we? There's about 6,000 public health service officers. Um, of across 11 categories, including physicians, dentists, I think the pharmacy, physicians, and the nurses are the largest of our categories, and the veterinarians are one of our smallest categories, and there's about 78 of us, and we can be assigned to any agency that has a contract with the public health service, and these are some examples of the organizations that can, we can be part of. Um, um, some a curiosity about the public health services that we have a long application process. And a lot of that is health-based. So uh, every little piece of your body, they go over x-rays, rectal exam, whatever, whatever, whatever. Every piece of you is looked at as part of your application process. Once you finish the application process, then it's up to you to then find a job. Um, we can help you find a job or give suggestions or tell you where there's places where jobs are available and we're doing a better job at it. I feel like when I came in, I had to find it on my own and I'll tell you how I did that really quickly. Um, and the Food Safety Inspection Service has public self service officers at plants and I never wanted to be in a plant. But that's a way that you can get into the organization and then work for them and find a different job. I was fortunate to be assigned to a headquarters position as an epidemiologist, so I was never in the field, although being in the field would have been helpful to me because uh, it would have given me a better foundation. But I stayed with them for about 10 years. Um, and the way I got the job, which will, some other people may say, is I belong to the Tuskegee Alumni Association in Washington, D.C. And I used to go to the meetings and we had several officers there. And I said, hey, I need a job. I can't find a job. My application was already done. I just had to find a job. Within two weeks, I had an interview at FSIS headquarters and I was employed within two weeks after that, so one month. So the moral of that story is, go out and meet people, be part of organizations that are veterinarians. You never know who you're gonna run into. Next slide. Uh, the public health service officers, like I said before, uh, that's our uniform, our working uniform when we get deployed, um, work in federal agencies. But another part of what we do is that the Surgeon General can activate us to go out in the community for public health emergencies. We usually go from two weeks to one month. And during the COVID outbreak, some people were gone for two to three months. So you must know that you'll have an office job, but you can be deployed too. And it's really hard to deny or say I'm not going because if you join, you're expected to be deployed. Next slide. Okay, the slides are gone. I think the next slide um, talks, um, is gonna introduce some of our deployments. And there'll be some pictures um, about me being deployed and some other officers. So some of the deployments that public health service officers have gone on, um, Ebola outbreak, they've gone out on, and veterinarians are going to those too, because they work um, in research, um, Oh, is that the next slide? Yeah. Um, oh, yes, that's what's in the, the next slide's coming. Thank you, next slide. So the left slide is the, someone that works for the Food Safety Inspection Service, go back one. 
Um, that's our old Surgeon General Vice Admiral Adams and then old AVMA President Dijon, I believe was his name. That's another public health service officer that works at NIH. She is a researcher there and she is board certified and I'm not sure what their degree is, but yeah. Um, at the bottom of the slide, that's um, Commander Willie Lanier. He's a veterinarian as well. And I believe Willie is a state public health veterinarian in Utah. Um, he's doing a vaccine at a vaccine clinic for uh, COVID-19. And that's me on the right at the bottom, um, helping one of our patients at a drive through clinic for COVID-19 as well. Uh, next slide. This is my last slide. This is a um, deployment for one of our officers on the left. She's given vaccines at a, a Native American reservation. Another officer in the middle on the top doing an examination for a working animal at the Independence Day celebration, uh, Fourth of July celebration in Washington, DC, which is a national security special event. The National Veterinary Response Team is deployed for those type of events to take care of the working animals. And we can also um, do companion animals and we do work in equine as well. The slide on the right, the Surgeon General and I with, with Hope, um, they're an organization that deploys their dogs to um, disasters and responses to comfort the people working. And that's the Health and Human Services SOC before COVID-19 really broke out. You see, we don't have masks on. And the next week after this, we were all sent home. It was just amazing. And I personally haven't been back to work for a few years. Um, at the bottom on the left is another public health officer who works for the Environmental Protection Agency, and she works on outbreaks at our national parks, et cetera. And that's me that says Wanda Street. I was deployed to um, Alaska. Uh, we did a rabies campaign in which we vaccinated about 250 dogs in Alaska where they were having um, constant rabies outbreaks. Um, it was the best deployment of my life and I still was only gone for two weeks. Um, I got to ride in my first <clears throat> helicopters every day and I was sick as a dog the first few days and then I was asking them to do maneuvers by the end of my weeks. That's another officer doing a humanitarian mission uh, where it says U.S. Public Health Service in the Caribbean. And that's another officer who um, was in was in the epidem epidemic intelligence service. That's another way to get in a public health service. So she's a veterinarian, I'll write it down, epidemic, I think it's intelligence service, and where she spends time doing public health um, overseas or within the states, and then they come into the public health service through that, you still have to find a job once you get in. Um, I'm sure you have many questions. My regular presentation is about 45 minutes, so I try to trim it down. Um, if you have any questions, I'm not sure if you allow them to ask me now or um, wait. Yeah. Wanda, I know you have to go because um, you are at a, Wanda is so kind to join us on a Saturday while she's at a volleyball tournament with her, with her family. So she's not playing volleyball, I understand, but she is cheering everybody on. So I think there are a couple of questions that related to this. So I will ask you specifically, Wanda, because I know you do have to depart. So the questions uh, that I'd love to know, maybe if you can share briefly with us, um, was around um you know, how, you know, you mentioned a little bit how you found your job and the application process, which was great. Um, and then kind of around the, you know, how long did you have to sign in to sign to be a contract? Like how long did you have a contract with them for? And then there were a couple of other things around the GI bill that I think some other people have jumped in to share in the, in the question and answers. So that was the, those were the ones that were really, really critical for you to answer. So around, you know, what's your best advice for people who want, who see this, see these roles, these incredible, impactful things that you've done. What is your best advice for them to get into this kind of role? Mm -hmm. So contact me. Okay. Talk you through it. Um, I will um, put you in contact with the public health service liaison, whose job is to take care of us and to bring people in. Um, she's a great person and I'll just um, contact you with her and she'll make corrections and give you all the specific information that you need as a student and um, as a veterinarian, if we have veterinarians on here as well. 
Um, so did I answer the question? Uh, yes, and there was one other one that's just come through here. With the public health service, is there relocation required for service apart from the deployment? Um, you are not forced to relocate. Okay. You can relocate. So let's say I wanted to go work at CDC in one of their zoonotic labs. Mm -hmm. And I found a job at CDC. The public health service will pay for your relocation to CDC, right? You have to have a job. It has to be all acceptable. All the paperwork has to be done, but they can relocate you. Um, I haven't heard of anyone being forced to relocate. Okay, great. You're forced to deploy. Right, okay. All right, I think that hopefully that helps, uh, that answers your questions, folks in the chat. Please keep these amazing questions coming. And our panelists, if you wanna go in and see the questions, um, then go into Q&A at the bottom. And then if you go to answered, cause I've been answering them as much as I can, there's open and answered. But if you have additional stuff to add in, cause I know you'll have amazing answers in here, please put them in. Um, I've been trying to pop in as, as much as I can. Um, our and I'm, we're gonna go to our next panelist. So thank you so much for joining us, Wanda. Okay, this is the AVMA slide, so I actually have some, so Amanda Fark was not able to join us today because she was at another student event. So what I what I wanted to share with this slides uh, with these slides, let me just pull up my notes here from Amanda, because she had given me some great information. Um, really, she wanted to share that for further resources from the AVMA, check out the student externship locator because you can find and apply for externships within public service, public health, and beyond. And then other information about the different career options, take a look at the current students and then your, your career section of the My Veterinary Career website. And then lastly, as you navigate your journey within the profession, keep informed and be inspired by your, pre by your peers and colleagues through AVMA podcast, which is great. And it's the third um, resource listed on the slides. Um, and then for further questions, feel free to connect with Amanda Fark because she is the Assistant Director of Veterinary Career Services at AVMA. So it's afark at uh, avma.org. And uh, AVMA has some incredible opportunities and incredible, like they really have a growing library of stuff and, uh, and great ways to find externships. So if you, uh, you know, if you've been asking questions, I know there were a couple of questions around, how do I find these kind of positions? How do I know what might be out there? It feels overwhelming. Pop over to AVMA because there will be some great stuff there. Um, okay, maybe we'll go to our next slide, Joe. Go ahead. Yep. And do check out those podcasts. And they, they're they actually kind of a nice thing. If you're studying and you're a student, it's so nice to have a podcast on. And if you're just, or if you're out for a run or whatever, it's just really lovely to have those. And they can be really helpful to, to start, just to start thinking about and get you inspired instead of getting, you know, get your head out of the books and, and think about different things while I think about what things might be, might be coming, uh, might be coming up. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce you to our last panelist, uh, Dr. Valerie Reagan. So Val, are you okay to unmute there? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm Valerie Reagan, and um, I, I'm a little different in some of the others in that I am a DVM full stop. So one of the questions I get in working with students and veterinarians is, do I need to have another degree to do any of this? And some things you do, but some things you do not. So my background is when I went to vet school, I thought that I would go into equine practice um, until I saw my equine professor kicked in the face and and we thought he was dead and was like, okay, I'll do that for fun. Um, so I went to do the only other thing I knew, I knew that veterinarians could do equine, food animal, um, you know, small animal practice or um, meat inspection. I thought that was the only work government vets did, which I knew I didn't want to do. Although it's great for some people, it wasn't my thing. So I went into small animal practice. Um, I was there actually five and a half years, but after three years, I started thinking, you know, I just want to do something different. Um, I didn't know what that was. I had no idea what the options were. Um, I was raised overseas. I was raised traveling my whole life. And I realized after a few years that I didn't want to be in that building the rest of my life. And the spays that used to terrify me were becoming routine. And um, I didn't have any opportunity for travel. So those are some things that I recognize that uh, later, actually, that that were making me a little antsy and wanting to do something different. But as I said, I had no idea what else there was. And I saw a brochure that one of our previous, um, I mean, one of our, our new hires that we just knew, new grads that we just hired had that said veterinary public practice career program with USDA. 
I had no idea what that was. I didn't even know there was public practice. Um, and I was, I looked at it. I saw pictures of veterinarians on airplanes and with horses and I applied, um, which I would not recommend that you go for jobs that way. Okay. I had no idea what I was getting into, but very long story short, um, I was hired and I went through a public practice training program for nine months with USDA APHIS Veterinary Services, which is the branch of USDA that deals with live animals and infectious diseases and, you know, exotic disease, foreign animal diseases, all kinds of things that I didn't know existed. Um, so I worked there as a, I went through a tra as a trainee and then I was stationed in um, South Florida as a field veterinarian, you've heard the phrase VMO already today. Their VMO is a veterinary medical officer and that I was stationed in the field. So I was dealing primarily with brucellosis in cattle. There are very large cattle ranchers in Florida, which I also didn't know. Um, and so I had kind of a trial by fire. So I'm a small animal vet doing brucellosis in cattle on ranches. Okay. And I grew up overseas, so I didn't grow up on farms. So it was like a total you know, fish out of water situation. But the thing that was important to recognize though, that I recognized later is that veterinary school gave me the basic skills that I need that could be applied in a whole lot of different areas. And so I never really thought about that before either. So long story short, I ended up doing that for a while. Then um, I became a, the national uh, the national brucellosis epidemiologist, a senior staff veterinarian after I'd done it for a number of years based in Washington, uh, based in just outside of Washington, D.C. In, in, in the headquarters in Maryland. Um, so I transferred up there. Actually, I went from Florida to, um, to Tennessee as the area epidemiology officer, which is uh, the epidemiologist. So we deal with, you know, overseeing all the disease programs, dealing with any disease outbreaks in the state, so on and so forth. And then I was promoted and moved up, as I mentioned, to the D.C. area as a national brucellosis epidemiologist, um, so I saw over, I oversaw the brucellosis program for the United States. So I was dealing with it where we had it still in a few states, traveling to those states to help them deal with the outbreak situations, spending a lot of time in Yellowstone because of brucellosis in the bison and elk in the area, um, and also doing a fair amount of work working with other governments uh, in tra training veterinarians overseas and helping veterinary, uh, I mean, helping some governments set up their veterinary infrastructure. Uh, for animal health. Uh, and then I was promoted into the assistant deputy administrator for veterinary services, which is like an administration of USDA APHIS veterinary services. Um, and so in that role, I was, I was the national, I was assigned the roles of national animal health coordinator. So I had, or so I had to work on creating a national integrated animal health surveillance system. Um, and also worked on national animal identification plans and I know a whole lot of things and still dealing with Yellowstone and brucellosis. Um, so, so there was a whole bunch of that kind of stuff that I was engaged in. And for me, it was really rewarding because I like challenges. I like to get new stuff to deal with. I like new problems to, to, to deal with. Um, and then after a few years in when I was in this administrative level, um, I was getting, I got some calls from some of the foreign governments that I'd worked with that said, hey, we need you to come come back and help us with some, some issues. I also was contacted by some large corporations, international corporations that had brucellosis in some of their herds. And they said, hey, can you come help us? And I couldn't because I'd been promoted past that level. So I recognized that that's where my heart was. So after a lot of planning and six months of learning how to do business plans, I left USDA, started a, a international uh, consulting company with, with a, a business partner uh, who was more on the political side, which I don't like. Um, but then I, so I was doing the kind of work I really loved. I was working with primarily Brucellosis internationally, um, setting up national animal health uh, systems internationally and doing some work in the U.S. for import export issues, veterinarians, I mean, companies that wanted to to deal with um, products and animals coming in and out of the country. I worked with some of those to facilitate that. And after doing that for about three and a half years, which was extremely lucrative, honestly. Um, so that was good. I was contacted by the Dean at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. And he had developed the RB51 brucellosis vaccine that we had switched to from the old strain 19 vaccine when I was a national brucellosis epidemiologist. So I got to know him really well through that connection. So there was an opening coming up for, to, for the director of the Center for Public and Corporate Veterinary Medicine at our college. 
And so he called me and he said, hey, I really want you to apply for this position. I didn't even, you know, I, I knew of the center. Um, I The, the per previous director was a friend of mine that I was actually hired with through USDA many years ago. Um, and I said, you know, I have to think about this. Um, I really, I realized I, I love Virginia Tech, which is where I'm based. Um, I really liked, I learned that I like teaching, which I didn't know about, never thought about that before. And it took me not too long to say, you know, I, I think I, I think I will do this. And so I sold my interest in the company because in the, in, in academia, you, at least in our college, you can spend up to 20% of your time uh, doing consulting, which I wanted to continue. Um, some of the, the consulting clients I had, the work that I enjoyed. So I took this job and after I sold out of that company, the next day I started another consulting company so that there would be no conflict of interest. I wouldn't have to check with a business partner about, you know, can we work on this? Will it conflict with my job? It was cleaner to just cut, start a new company, which I still have. Um, this was almost 14 years ago. Um, I still have that company. I still do international work, primarily brucellosis. I do the stuff I want to do, not anything else. Um, and I, so what, with the Center for Public and Corporate Veterinary Medicine, as you can see on this slide, uh, we have a full-time faculty uh, devoted to, 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 to teaching veterinarians and veterinary students about public corporate medicine. And so we have a full-time public and corporate track at our college um, that we have students who are interested in non-private practice careers often will get into that track. So when, I, when the dean called me about this, I said, well, tell me what the job description is. And he said, I want you to think about what the veterinarian of the future needs to look like. I want you to figure out how we need to train them to be that person and that, that veterinarian. And then I want you to do it. And to me, that was like the perfect job description. Okay, give me a big challenge. Don't tell me how to do it. Don't micromanage. You know, just let me do my thing. So we've completely revised the track. Uh, we've added a whole new section over the years on career transition assistance with veterinarians because we've been contacted by so many veterinarians wanting to change careers. And some of the questions are, you know, how do I find these jobs? And I've seen some of them roll up here. You know, how do I find these jobs? How do I get into them? How do I know I'm overwhelmed with what's out there? How do I, how do I know to find that? Um, and so a, a few, I know we're getting short on time. We need to leave time for questions, but a few take home messages that I learned from my career path that I would um, encourage you to think about. One is follow your passion. I did not know to actively sit back and think, what are my personal preferences in a job? The mistake most veterinarians do is they wanna leave one job and they apply for another one. Just, you know, the, well, this job pays a lot of money or this job is open, so I think I'll apply without ever stepping back and saying, what is it that I'm looking for? And, and it doesn't mean a job, I'm not talking about a job title. I'm talking about like for me, for example, I wanted to be able to travel. I wanted new challenges regularly. I didn't want to get anything routine. I wanted to, um, I finally found I really like to teach. So, and I like brucellosis, I like infectious diseases. I like, um, you know, setting up veterinary infrastructures. So, so by what we do with our students, and with the, the veterinarians that go through our career transition workshops is we go through and say, step back and, and do a personality test, find out if you're an introvert or an extrovert, because those are two different job types that you should get into, and then find out where your passion areas are, and then use those to find jobs. Search using your findings to find career opportunities. So, um, so, so it, I recognize that as I made my career changes, I really was accidentally following my passions. I was learning to go into new areas because I recognize that this is the kind of thing I'm enjoying. The other point I make with our students that I think is also very important, um, and I've heard from veterinarians that say, you know, I've, I've been in practice for one year or 20 years, and I feel like I'm a failure if I leave, like I, I'm not a real veterinarian. And what I say to that is to think about that as you go through your career, just like you go through your life, your interest will change and you'll become exposed to more things that you find interesting. And so the things that you really enjoy on day one, you may not enjoy 15 years later. Like the first time I spayed a cat in, in practice, I think I opened it up this far and I was sweating like a hog and it took me, I guess hogs don't sweat, but anyway, it took me forever to do that. 
But, you know, after five years, I could do it in 10 minutes with two sutures. And for me, it just wasn't a challenge anymore. Whereas for some people, that's when they're comfortable. That's when they want to keep doing it because now I got this. I'm not nervous anymore. Now I'm going to do this and be comfortable, which is great. We need people like that. People like me say, okay, now I've mastered this. I need to master something new. And so recognizing that about yourself may help you decide, you know, where you want to go. The problem with looking for a job without doing that is that you are probably going to look in the same circles that you've already been in because that's what you know. And so, you know, I've worked with veterinarians that have gone from, you know, one practice to the next practice, to the next practice, to the next practice, and say, you know, this practice was bad because of this, this practice was bad because of this, and so on and so forth, until I finally say, maybe practice isn't, isn't what you're looking for. Maybe it's something else. And so, you know, you can kind of see the light bulb. Oh, yeah, I guess so. You know, maybe it is me. Um, but, but following your passion and, and learning to search with that passion area is important. And also recognize, I like the phrase, growing as a professional. As you go through your career and you get these new experiences and you get these new interests and things develop that uh, maybe jobs that weren't there 10 years ago, it's good to grow into these new areas. And the example I use is you don't play with the same toys today, most likely, that you played with when you were five years old. So looking in that area. So, so we oversee this track. Uh, we work with veterinary students. We do it. If you're a student, we do have scholarships available, travel scholarships for veterinary students wanting to go do public practice clerkship opportunities. We do career transition workshops for veterinarians. If you're a veterinarian that wants to change careers, you'll see that there's an email there that you can send us an email. We'll add you to our Google group. We've got over 800 veterinarians there. But people send us job announcements, say, hey, I'm looking for a veterinarian to do this, and it's non-private practice careers. We send that out to the group. The other thing is that we have a, if you're interested in changing careers as a veterinarian, we do have a career transition workshop coming up. We only do them about once a year, um, but we, the, it is open right now for, um, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to put the link to it in, in the chat. I just thought about that. It is open to, uh, for, uh, until, I forget the date, early April. We do them in the evenings. Um, we're starting at April 17th, that Monday night, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the next week, that week, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the next week. We do them in the evenings. They're virtual so that if you're working, you can come home and do it. We do tape tape the, all of the, the, um, the presentation so that you can watch them later if you're still in, in the clinic or whatever. So so that's what we do. I Again, this is a passion area for me now that I didn't know existed there before. Um, and so um, I direct this center. We do have several faculty members now in the center working on this, this type of area full-time to, to try and help people with interest in moving into public and corporate veterinary medicine. So Melanie, I'll stop there. Um, I could talk for two hours because I get myself fired up, but I think I'll stop. Valerie, it has been so fast. I mean, I just love hearing everybody's stories. And that's, I, I think I didn't know all of those things about you. So and I think I've known you for, I don't even know how many years. For now. a long time. Yeah. I know. We it's so lovely yeah. to hear your story. You every too. day, right? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that neat? I actually feel like we're very, very similar in that regard. It's so, so neat to hear that. Um, so there was a question in the chat here that I just wanted to get to before we do open question period. And this, this is quite important slide here. So there was a question specifically for you, Valerie, around does VAMD at, at Virginia, Maryland offer any unique rotations for four Fourth year students with with the public health route that are not students at the college. So could they come from a different college and come and do an externship like that is, is allowed at other colleges like UPenn or other places? So that's a great question. So we don't actually take students ourselves into the center um, unless you want to work on a specific project, which we may be able to do. So what I would do is, 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 is suggest that you email me with, if you have a specific interest that you're interested in working on, let me know and let's talk about what your interests are and if we have anything going in that area. If not, maybe I can help direct you towards uh, somebody that would be working in the area that you have an interest in. So send me an email, happy to chat with you. Um, I, I am out of, I'm helping my dad move right now. I'm gonna be out of the office for a while. So um, be, be patient if I don't answer you right away, but I'll get back to you as soon as I, as soon as I finish this major project. 
And what I have, what I noticed is that there's a lot of resources in these slides. So what we might do is send this all out afterwards, because Valerie, you've put in this uh, the career transition workshop, and there, and I know there's been other mentions of other things. So what we might do is when the recording is ready, Joe, maybe I can check this with you that maybe we can send out all of the resources that were mentioned. So then it's all together in one spot. Would that be possible? Yes, it would be. Okay, perfect. So we'll do that. So not yep. to worry if you see someone that you missed, you know, you missed their email address. Don't worry, we'll send it out to. We'll make sure you get it all. Um, yeah, so and just, yeah. Uh, sorry, Melanie, I just see one quick question if I could answer it really fast. Yes, go for it, yeah. To, to uh, Stephanie, will the transition workshops be recorded? They will be recorded and available for thirty days after the after that because there's always somebody who can't attend one of these. So. Perfect. And there's another, the email contacts. Yes, we'll send those out afterwards because I don't want you to lose any of that. Like they're really valuable people and they've all offered to be available for you if you needed any questions answered. So, so appreciate that. So I'm just going to let you know, these are some summary. This is just a summary slide, but these are a couple of hot tips and then we'll go right into questions here. So pop, get your questions in there. I've been monitoring them. And then we've got some big questions for our, uh, for our panelists as well. So uh, make sure that you're joining veterinary associations that are in your areas of interest. So there may be that, you know, they may be all of the organ feel free to join as many of those organizations as you want to that are on the that are partners with this the united states animal health association the nafb i mean you're entering into um in public practice we love acronyms so just be aware of <laughs> <laughs> that you're entering into acronym land. So join as many of those acronym groups as you would like. Almost all of them offer a student membership or, they're, or you're allowed to attend and they sometimes they offer a student um, student bursaries to attend um, a attend a conference and sometimes they're local to you. So make sure that you're checking those out. Um, contact a non-clinical veterinarian if you're on and if you don't know any, then go on to LinkedIn and check and see if there's any that you know uh, spikes piques your interest and see if you can connect with them. Because to be perfectly honest with you, what I know after talking to hundreds of non-clinical veterinarians is that they're so willing to help and share their journey and share and, and help other people. We're a helping profession. And I think if you're asking for, you know, hey, can we have a 15 minute coffee chat? Um, hey, can I ask you a couple of questions about your career path? Nobody's going to say no to you or very few of them. They might just be too busy to answer at the time. Time, but honestly, there's almost everybody is going to be willing to do that. And there, we're all, we, I know that there's so much need in the public service too. It's not like these jobs are scarce. So you're going to, there's going to be lots of interest to speak with you. Um, Dr. Reagan has, has uh, indicated that you can email her and all of our panelists have been open to that. Um, so please make sure that you are doing that. Um, I am going to ask if we can turn off the slides, Joe, and then if we panelists, if you want to turn on your videos again, then we'll start into questions and I will weave in the Q and A's as they're coming up here. Um, so the, as we, I'll just get that, get that going and I'll give you a chance to put your, um, to put your questions into the chat too, or into the Q and A. Um, big question. So the biggest question that I know that we get all the time, and some of our panelists have covered this, we're going to do this first, because I know it's, there's been a lot of questions in the, in the Q and A is what's your best advice for finding a public practice role? Um, so if you give even just one tip, what would be your best tip for that? And I will maybe call upon Valerie, perhaps you've got, you probably, I mean, you probably could talk all day about this. Um, kind of, as I mentioned, first of all, define what you're interested in. Um, and so when, once you kind of define what you're interested in and there, and that some, that's can be a challenge sometimes, uh, one of the things, um, that you could do to, to really kind of trigger some memory, uh, some, some thoughts is to go to the USAHA website. I think you mentioned it, Melanie, I'm not sure if it's in the question or otherwise, but that should be one of the resources, maybe USAHA, which is U.S. Animal Health Association, um, is an organization that all the state vets are members of, a lot of federal vets, a lot of industry vets. And if you go to their website, usaha.org, and look at committees, you'll see a lot of different topic areas that you can review and see if that triggers anything. Yeah, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in that. And then once you've kind of identified the things that you're really interested in, kind of convert those into search terms and use those to search. Um, you can search on usajobs.gov if you're looking for veterinary I mean, if you're looking for federal government jobs, you can also search if you go to LinkedIn and put those search terms in, you can look for under jobs there. You can also look under, you can put those search terms in and look and click on people and you'll see different people doing that kind of work that you may want to connect with and talk with. And you'll, or you also may see the kinds of jobs that they're doing that may, may give you some ideas of things to do. You can also look at if it's a veterinary related job, like a wildlife job or a zoo job, any of those signs, you can look at the veterinary associations related to those 
like if you zoom all life, you can look at AAZV. And so some of those more um, defined areas in veterinary medicine will only post their jobs in their areas, uh, uh, in their websites rather. They won't pay to post them elsewhere because they only want to attract a certain person with a certain area of interest. You can also use those search terms on indeed.com, monster.com, any of those, those, those um, you know, general search engines, but you need to really define what you're looking for. And so, and also keep in mind, you know, if you just put travel um, outdoors, you're going to get a million things that aren't going to apply at all. So make sure you add in maybe travel, but infectious disease or public health or whatever you're interested in, just to start to see what kinds of things are out there. So that's a general way to get started. Love that. Yeah. Sort of like mindful searching. Cause I think we often get into this, like scrolling through jobs, don't we? And exactly. Then like, and then you think, oh, maybe I and you can spend all weekend applying for a job when it may not even be the right fit for you. Exactly. And so, so you know, veterinarian jobs isn't going to help you def find things that are probably going to be a good fit for you. You need more, you need more specificity than that. Yeah. You need to know yourself. And, and I would also say that a lot of people, you know, you do know yourself really well. You just have to ask their questions of yourself, you know, that nobody else has those answers, but you likely have that stuff. You might just not have been, we, you know, you might just not have, have asked yourself those questions in that way. So love that advice. Uh, Joe, I'm going to go to you. One piece of advice, if you're looking at what's the best way to get into a, a, a public practice job. Networking. Yeah. Call up, call up your state veterinarian's office. And, uh, and ask to speak to any of the veterinarians in the office. You may not need to speak to the state veterinarian, but you can speak to the other six people perhaps working in their office. Uh, ask them who the section veterinarian is that, uh, that lives near you uh, or near your college and invite them to come give a presentation to your class uh, about public practice jobs in the area. And, um, I think that's the best way to do that is to just talk to people about those jobs, find out what's available and, um, and find out what it takes to, to do one of those jobs and whether or not they do the things that you would enjoy doing. Love that. And you know, if you listened really closely to all these people's stories, all of our panelists, a lot of their jobs came up through networking, you know, like Valerie and Joe, or like so many of these things, it wasn't, it wasn't by happenstance. It was because they knew people and they'd made connections and they'd invested time in doing that. So that can feel really daunting, but take a small step like Joe has, Joe's recommended and just have a coffee with somebody or just reach out to on LinkedIn. It doesn't have to, you don't have to blitz 8,000 people. Just reach yep. out to a couple people to start off with. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. Um, okay. I'm going to go to Donna and then I'm coming to you, Joy. One tip for one tip for how to get into a public practice role if you're still there. Uh, I am. Yes. I. Oops. Sorry. Uh, yes. I just wanted to sit, reiterate what I had uh, originally uh, written down uh, for the direct answers on those. Was that um, uh, if you have the opportunity to join in, um, any of these associations now as a student member, you should consider doing that. The the uh, organizations are, are really going to be sustained moving forward with younger people, certainly. But more importantly, there are a lot of uh, uh, people who are very eager to share their experiences and specifically to mentor. Um, I myself have, uh, have been approached um, several times uh, because I'm, I'm pretty visible within the organization. But, but again, just simply because people want to know uh, how to proceed forward with different ideas in terms of their career. And again, as a student, you have the opportunity to uh, participate with the organization, not just as a, a quiet background member, but a lot of times there's committees. And when you get involved with things like committees, you get to you know, work with other people and again, develop these perhaps mentoring type of relationships. In addition, you become very visible to other members within the organization. And some of these organizations have a lot of members. And so here's where you have the opportunity to shine while you're working within the committee. And that, that's when people notice you. And sometimes they'll throw <laughs> these opportunities right in front of you. They'll, or they'll do something like, like say, uh, hey, you know what? I think you'd be really great in this kind of uh, particular, let's say, public service type of role. And you'll find that the doors will open for you because of that. 
So again, if you want to make a difference in your life and really start to see what is out there for you, you have to keep your eyes open and take advantage of participating with, um, with all of these organizations. And again, please know that we, that we are really here for you because you are the future. Oh, I love that Thanks. advice, Sona. And yeah, and I think too, like the other depth of uh, the other the other in interesting thing about what you shared there is that it's quite important as a veterinarian. So even if you're a veterinarian and you're still in practice to do that kind of thing, because, you know, one of the big stumbling blocks is that, and Valerie, I know you and I have had this conversation before, is that it is hard to, you know, it can be hard, it can feel hard to have those transferables or to know those transferable skills and to be able to put those on paper. But working on a committee shows that you can work in an organization. You can, you know what it's like to show up to meetings on time. You know what it's like to be organized in those things. So it, it is really helpful. And as Donna says, so visible because you are, you are the, you're what everybody wants to see. I mean, I, you know, we know, we all know that we go to a lot of these meetings and there's, I'm going to say it, there's a lot of gray hair there. So we need some younger people for sure. We would love to see students there. Um, Joy, I'm going to go to you. One tip that you could give to getting into public practice. Um, so I just have two very brief, quick tips. Um, the first one is, uh, I think um, Wanda mentioned it already, um, to consider USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. They have openings, um, um, all the time. That's how I got my foot in the door. Um, if you look at our staff here at Department of Agriculture and Markets um, and our, uh, uh, the program managers um, in our office, at least half of them have worked for USDA FSIS at some point in their life. Um, and two, if you're interested in working for a state ag, contact the office, find out what their hiring process is. You know, we, um, it, it is quite a um, intricate process um, given that you have to take a civil service exam that is only offered um, at certain points. <laughs> Um, of time. So find out what that is so that you can get on an email list and they'll send you notifications about when exams are offered so you don't miss that opportunity. Um, it is difficult to reach somebody who is not on the civil service list. And with that, I will close that out. <laughs> Love that. Okay, super. So if you have more questions, type them in. We're going to keep going. So we're at 1.30 right now. So we're at our time. So we're going to, if there's any other questions, we can probably stay on for another minute and kind of answer another couple minutes and answer anything, any other last questions. Um, but maybe what I'll do is ask if any of our panelists, just as a concluding question, what's the one thing that um, really inspires you and continues you in your, can, allows you to continue interest in this part of your career? So I would just love to know that. And it's a nice parting question. So um, perhaps I'll go to you, Joy, first, because we ended with you last time. <laughs> um, most inspiring. I have to say, I, I think I already mentioned this once, but it's, it's uh, honestly, um, you know, the people that I meet every day, the people that I interact with, um, I'm just in awe of, of um, you know, of everything that people, um, um, you know, that uh, everything that, how competent our field staff is, um, Sorry, a little bit of interruption there. Um, and, and just, um, you know, how great it is to work with um, the, such a diverse group of people. Um, it's been really, really wonderful. Great, thank you. Uh, Joe, what about you? Making a difference. When I was in small animal practice, I would think of myself as a glorified toy repairman. I could fix the knee on that poodle and that would take care of that. But uh, I traded my scalpel for a pen and I affect global animal health. And that's what still inspires me to be working today. Even though I've retired, um, I'm still making a difference on a, on a global scale. I get to work with members of Congress now and write pieces of legislation that will affect how um, how the, the practice of veterinary medicine will be done in the future. So. Thank you, Joe, that's, a, that's incredible. And Valerie, what about you? I think for me, a, a couple of things. One is the recognition, which again, took me a long time. I'm slow to figure this stuff out, but the recognition that in public practice, I'm convinced that there's something for everybody, no matter what your, your background is, your interests are, whether you're an introvert, an extrovert, um, you know, th there is a job in there in federal or state government for every kind of interest. And to me, that's inspiring. And, and it, it help, I, the thing that keeps me really interested in this, the work I'm doing now is first of all, I, I enjoy the engagement in the international stuff I still do, but I also get a lot of pleasure out of helping veterinarians and seeing them get into a new career area and seeing them kind of re-energized and, and, and getting past the, I hate veterinary medicine. It's not that you hate veterinary medicine, you're in a bad 
career fit. So that satisfaction of being able to see people kind of re-engage and recognize that, yeah, I, there is still something out there for me that's going to make me feel fulfilled. That's what keeps me really inspired. Love that. And Donna, what about you? Uh, yes, you know, I want to I want to admit something that I don't know that I've ever told anyone. It's OK. It's, it's, it's not what you think. But what I want to admit is that there was a time when I really thought that veterinary medicine had failed me. And um, honestly, it was 2008. It was it, it was a time that was hard financially for me. I didn't realize that everybody else pretty much was having a hard time, too, because at that point I was just concentrating on trying to survive. Um, I ended up joining the Army. Yes, it was the Army Reserves because obviously I was too old to get into active duty. But the point is um, that led to a really remarkable way forward for me and provided an incredible financial stability and benefits from my family. Not the least was uh, really fantastic health insurance. And now it's morphed into um, my veterans benefits and again, health insurance. So over and above um, what Val had said, I, I got to tell you, you know, if, if you're unhappy in veterinary medicine, don't give up on it. A and I want to say something else that was really quite remarkable. I was terrified of deploying. Um, I ended up deploying nine, nine months after I joined and they sent me to Afghanistan. Um, that said, once I started working, it was pretty much military working dogs. And I was so fulfilled then. And I'll tell you why. It was simply the fact that there was no direct money involved with me having to say to clients, it's going to be this much money and try to convince them. Because the deal is this, the military working dog handlers have to listen to everything you tell them to do and they must do it. It was so awesome. Not that it was a power trip. It was that I had really fantastic results with these dogs and I felt satisfied, successful, and happy all the time, even in the midst of that. So again, it, you'll be you'll be surprised. Just just look around everywhere within veterinary medicine, and and this is just a small slice of it that you've had today. You know, again, if you get involved with these groups, a lot of our associations have very inexpensive student membership. Take advantage of that. You will be shocked with what you find out that many of the, the folks in these organizations have had several careers within their lifetime that all has to do with veterinary medicine. It, it's unbelievable. You don't find that when you're going through, as an example, you know, our go-to places, the AVMA Career Center, and, you know, click on the different categories. It is nothing compared what you find out in real life when you're talking to people. And Valerie's shaking her head too. She's seen it. That's so amazing. Yeah. And that's, that's just, I love, I love all of that advice. And I think that's really, I think that's what, um, that's what inspires me every day too, is just the, you know, the ability to see so many opportunities and how things are going to change and evolve and how much impact we can have. And, and it's instead of a one-to-one -one relationship, you can have a one-to-many relationship and anywhere that you have problem solvers and critical thinkers, you find veterinarians, you find them like in Canada are, the person who's our OIE delegate um, is our row delegate and food safe food food safety delegate for our country is a veterinarian. Are the head of um, public health in Canada and and in, um, is is a veterinarian. <clears throat> we find veterinarians in all kinds of places and there are so many roles. So that's why I always say like your unique perspective and the skills that you bring are so needed in this profession. We need you and there are so many things that you can that you can achieve. So I'm going to conclude that Donna. Did you have one one last thing to say? Oh my gosh, I don't know why I forgot to say this, but I think it's true for everyone here. Um, when you work for the federal government, whether it be like I did for the military, which is Department of Defense or, or civilian service or what have you, you, you get the opportunity for retirement. This, <laughs> that's unheard of in veterinary medicine. And and I just want to point out that that's one of the benefits. I'm not sure anyone really talked about matching 401ks. Uh, again, I, I've never experienced the kind of financial stability that I have because I made that drastic change. And then even though I've been out of the military now for three years, um, I still have that financial security that was because of it. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And that's just a really wonderful, that's kind of a wonderful ending point. Thank you everybody for joining and we were gonna conclude. So we're gonna um, end the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and this will be uh, sent out to you as a recording.